we'd like to start. Thanks, Daniel. Are we good? Okay. Okay. Okay, good morning, colleagues. Can we take a seat? And we would love to start. Um, can I flip over? Can I have a presentation? Um, good morning and welcome. We know that it is shocking that you've got to be inside with the weather as beautiful as it is. Um, my name is Edgar Peterson. I'm the director of the African Center for Cities, and it's an enormous pleasure for me to welcome you to a convening that we've been trying to do for some time. And uh, initially, it was COVID that scuppered our well-laid plans. And, uh, but of course, as um, human beings, we like to see uh, misfortune or unintended events as a blessing in disguise. And in this case, I think it is indeed the case, because it's been good to live through the multiple crises that COVID induced and to come together in person uh, in a slightly different world, slightly off its axis. And for me, it is especially wonderful to have everyone here because we have a convergence of worlds. We have a convergence of um, the event we had yesterday, which was an academic conference, um, where, and quite a few of the scholars who put participated in yesterday's conference are here today and very keen to understand whether this, these other worlds that I talk about, the policy worlds, the political worlds, the business worlds, the suits, is in fact real or not. And so to kind of have an opportunity to create a convergence of this sort is, is, is special. And I am deeply appreciative of everyone that's here and the time that you've invested. My job this morning is not just to welcome you, but to also give you the backstory as to why we're here and what it is we're going to wrestle with and we're going to engage around over the next two days. And at the heart, of course, of the three-day convening is this question, why are we obsessing about infrastructure? To answer this question, it is important to remind ourselves of the precipice that the world is standing at. And the IPCC report of April earlier this year reminded us that we have less than three years remaining as a species, as a global community, to peak our emissions. And then we've got to go downhill at an incredible speed. Of course, we know with the disappointing outcome of, COVID, of COP27 that we are going to miss that objective by a mile, right? We know this. We also know that within that context, Africa is particularly marginalized and disadvantaged and will carry and experience the brunt of the fallout of this failure of global governance. And it's not just the disappointment on COVID and what that represents, but it is in the midst of a much larger sets of dislocations, whether it be the war in Ukraine and the knock-on effects on inflationary pressures and food security, whether it is the destabilization of the tech market, or it is the resurgence of proud as you can be, right-wing populism and fascism, as we've recently seen with the Italian elections. And what these dimensions represent is a further illustration, an, ex an expression of the governance failures that we are confronted with. And the issue for us is that we can't simply take cognizance of it and kind of put on our smart aleck political hats and see how do we maneuver through this. Because there's a whole set of systemic processes underway which are larger than these contemporary moments and events. And it is at the intersection of these systemic processes, whether it is the triple environmental crises, climate, biodiversity, resource material extraction, or it is the fact that we've got a bifurcation of the demographic structure of the world with the youthful populations being in Africa and Asia and aging, dying of populations being in the global north, or whether it is the profound dislocation that the technological transformation and digitalization represents, not just for work, but for questions of sociality, for questions of meaning, for questions of identity, for questions of even things as fundamental as nationhood, as statehood, citizenship, right? All of these things coming together, aggregating in a really profound way where people live, 
where they make love, where they have families, where they have aspirations, where they cultivate their dreams. And we know that this is all deeply in peril. And this manifests in a very particular phenomenon in the African context, which I suggest is a form of socioeconomic stunting. What that means is that our youthful population that will translate into a trebling of the labor force over the next 30 years are stuck. They are stuck in a term, internal way to it. Bec and this is reinforced by multidimensional inequality and, of course, then the climate impacts. And we've got to confront the fact that none of our mainstream frameworks is nimble enough, precise enough, or ambitious enough to deal with this fundamental crisis. And it comes together in the most profound way in our cities. What are we to do? And so our proposition is that maybe a way that we can begin to tame this complexity, help us focus to understand what the entry points might be, is something like this policy canvas. So this is not a pathway. It is just a canvas. It is just a set of possibilities to think around, to act around, to instantiate, and hopefully to institutionalize in new ways. So we've got this question that is driving the fiscus of many economies as they're trying to recover from the series of cascading shocks, whether it was 2008, COVID, and of course, the current inflationary crisis. And how are they doing that? Infrastructure spend, right? Build back better. The green building, I can't even remember all of the phrases, but you know what I'm talking about. But in fact, the real challenge is to not just focus on infrastructure, but to connect that to questions of building our cities differently, both in terms of the carbon intensity of our urban form, but also the way we live, the livability, the well-being that is possible. And none of these things are achievable without a radical transformation of planning, zoning, and regulatory processes. Now, the political challenge is that you can't realize these things which as urbanists we can see, we can almost feel, we can touch, if you don't have deep social cultural transformation. Culture drives political behavior. Culture drives political aspiration and demand. And so we cannot simply think of this as a technocratic exercise. It is a profoundly social cultural transformation that is at the heart of this. And so, how do we think about this political embedding in the context of rising populism, of extremism, of, if you will, um, the plutocrats of the world capturing state machineries all over the place? Now, what is convenient about this particular canvas that we're using as a device for the next two days is that it graphs quite nicely onto what our governments have in different ways agreed to as kind of broad frameworks, visionary aspiration documents that is meant to translate into national objectives, national plans, and then, of course, uh, in our uh, um, incurable hierarchical mindsets, aligned city-level plans, right? Uh, uh, this beautiful idea of cascading plans, or everything is beautifully aligned. So, okay, we all know that's a fiction, but let's pretend for a moment that there is value in the idea that these policy frameworks help diverse and conflicting interests to aggregate a perspective, to aggregate resources and intent so that we can move in somewhat the same direction. And that's what these frameworks do. So they've got a utility, they've got a value. Now, what we've done is to kind of stay with that infrastructure piece is to try and say, what does this mean in the African context? Given the crisis of work, Given the deepening of multidimensional inequality, the extreme exposure to climate change impacts, we believe that we've got to define what, uh, what sustainable infrastructure could entail along these lines. I'm not going to go through the detail of that. We've got two days to talk through this, but you can read the slide as I'm talking. And you can see it references this question of rethinking the notion of value. How do we in turn value through these investments in the most deprived neighborhoods by recognizing value not just to be financial, right, but to understand the power of circularity and the power of an aggregation through looping back different forms of value. Now, in more practical parlance, it gives us the opportunity, both as scholars, as policy leaders, and as activists, to say that if we take this 
yearning for a post-extractive capitalist frame, which I would argue is what the notions of the circular economy, the care economy, the solidarity economy is all about. And can we use those to say that all of these sectors that drive investment, that drive cities as, system, as a system of systems, in fact can be reimagined, can be recast, and we'll come back to this theme of the imaginary, of imagination, of how we are trapped by what we can imagine a little bit later on this morning. But this is the proposition, that there is a world awaiting us of rethinking, of remaking, of reinvesting, of restructuring that could really drive a collective Pan-African agenda. And all of us need to be part of figuring out the detail of this framework, right? And so the objectives of the conference is, th this is a very intentional space. And so we've crafted the next two days in a way that allows us to listen to people who've done a lot and who've thought a lot about certain things and have an important part of the puzzle. And it is designed in a way to allow us to put together the puzzle in our own unique way. And the idea is not to have a resolved puzzle at the end, but is to have a really beautiful mosaic of different forms of sense making so that we can have different kinds of conversations with each other. And we think that that is a precondition for the kind of coherence we need to foster across our sectors, across our institutions, across levels of government, across different political ideologies and so forth. And so, of course, it means we kind of need to, as all very important, smart, clever, important people, we kind of need to switch off a certain part of our brain that assumes we kind of know what the person is gonna say and we kind of have already got a response and just open ourselves, just for two days, like just open ourselves and avoid the kind of Twitter filtering reading of the world where a word, a phrase, a notion already preempts what you think the person is gonna say. Like, we, we need to take the care to get over ourselves. Um, there's a lot happening in parallel at the moment. For me, you know, because I work on these big met meta trends and what it means, people often ask me, like, don't you, <laughs> you know, kind of just wallow in a pit of depression? And I don't, because actually in doing this work, I meet amazing organizations and people and innovators and inventors all the time because there are thousands of brilliant Africans doing amazing work, but we don't always articulate these things or see them in concert and see them as, in fact, the front end of a set of transformations that is responding to the crises that I tried to paint earlier. Um, and, 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 and so the question for me is how do we really together in conversation figure out how do we build aggregate impact? So, of course, we live in language, we live through language. We have Dilip Melanier, who is a professor at Wits and did the keynote yesterday, a historian and a fantastic humanities scholar. And Dilip reminded us yesterday of the power of language, of words, and of images and stories fundamentally. And so the invitation to all of us, and of course, if I had a little bit more energy and time, I would at this point cue a fantastic Ben Okri quote about storytelling. Um, uh, I didn't do that. But um, the point is that that is exactly uh, why we're here. We are gonna try and figure out a new story to tell ourselves and to tell each other and to tell the world and we'll come back to the theme of stories. So we've built a very specific arc for the next two days. We'll start off this morning with some of our best minds telling us what the hell is going on in the world. And um, that's the opening panel, and we'll have different perspectives, different takes on that, but these are folk who operate at spheres of the world and influence and decision making and so on. So they kind of have a perspective that us mere mortals don't easily access. So it's great to have them kick us off. Um, we'll then go to the core issue to begin to build the shared, la shared language. What is sustainable infrastructure? But to answer that question, we thought we kind of have to remind ourselves of what's the implicit imaginary at play when we hear this signifier infrastructure. And so we've got 
a treat awaiting you, a visual oral treat awaiting you all the way from Port Harcourt um, to help us on that journey. And then we'll go to very specific places on the continent where they are building these things literally with, with, with their hands and with their hearts and imaginations. And then we'll kind of go back up in scale and say, okay, if we don't, and as Trevor will tell you, if you don't convince the ministers of finance of things and it doesn't make sense to them, um, it ain't gonna happen, my friend. So we have to figure out what is the macroeconomic story we're telling. Why do these things matter for <clears throat> the bigger narrative about how we're gonna get inclusive and sustainable growth on the continent? What is that connection? And so we've got to spend some time there to piece through what that argument in rationale is. And then, of course, we've got to, you know, kind of get down to brass tacks and talk about the money. And in our view, and we did a piece of work over the last year and a half with the Alfred Herrhaus and Gashoska, with Liza Chirulia and other colleagues, where we try to under unpack what are the financial implications of these sustainable infrastructure transitions. And the one conclusion after we did a survey of all the inflowing finance and the terms of those financial flows is that probably a good 80, 85% of African municipalities simply do not qualify to access the available conventional finance or green or sustainable or whatever you wanna call it, finance that is starting to emerge. They just don't, they're not bankable, they are not regarded as a safe investment. And so we've got a crisis because we're gonna more than double our urban population within five electoral cycles, right? Think of it in those terms, five, six electoral cycles, more than double our urban. How are we gonna build the institutional capability with the resources to deal with what that implies in terms of service delivery, access to land, healthcare, education, and so forth? So there is a problem, Houston, and so we need to ask some big and profound question about the architecture and the design of financial systems to see whether it is indeed possible to begin to match the scale of the demand, the institutional complexity with the necessary resources. Tomorrow morning then, we shift register a little bit and we tap into the soul and we will bring in questions of aesthetics and beauty and design because it is absolutely fundamental to how we calibrate these different things and for infrastructures to sing. They need design and they need to resonate with where people are at and what communities desire. And then we will go and give uh, the pointy heads an opportunity to talk about data and evidence and argument and why that is a precondition for effective decision making and most importantly for a kind of substantive citizenship that allows communities to drive their own development because they control the reading and the understanding of their context. And then we come to, I guess, the biggest political challenge we face. Our city governments are not empowered. They are not empowered to lead this fight. And if that does not change, we can get all of the policy canvases right, but we are not gonna transform the political economy on the ground, because we need political leaders where it matters, with the power, with the resources, and with the legitimacy to do the difficult work. And then we'll talk about innovation, because as you will see over the next two days, there are so many interdependent complexities here that if we don't create safe spaces for experimentation and learning, uh, we are not really gonna make much of a difference. And of course, we will conclude the day with trying to, to, to filter for ourselves. What do we take away from this? How do we, what do we do different in our own practice once we, we leave the conference and how can we work together in different ways and so forth? And so this conference comes on the back of work we've done over the last few years. I'm gonna skip over this because we don't have time and just um, uh, uh, end off with a few practicalities. So we want this to be a really, despite the design of the room, to be a horizontal space. Um, and so we are asking you to kind of, we know you're all super accomplished, um, but I'm just Edgar for the next two days, and we hope everyone is happy and comfortable that we 
we kind of just go pretty informal. Um, secondly, and that doesn't mean disrespectful, it just means conversational. And we're kind of in the, in the lounge, we're having a chat. Um, and I think that that's really important if we're gonna have the space to be frank and to call a spade a spade, because that's kind of what we need if we're gonna make a difference. Um, we know all of you are invested in things you've worked on for a long time in your organization. You've got this brilliant framework, you've got the solution and so on. Like, great, um, but not the time to do a sales job, okay? So, um, in the breaks, cool. Um, afterwards, uh, when people have signed up to your Twitter account, Instagram, fine, uh, but not the next two days, okay? And certainly not if, you know, you're in, in the hot chair um, and so on. We kind of want people to reflect on things they are doing and that they're struggling with, the questions they have. That's what we're trying to build the conversation around. Um, and generosity goes a long way, and so what we've done with each of the sessions is to try, we don't always get it right, but to kind of split the airtime 50% between the folk who will lead the conversation through the panels and 50% for the audience to engage. And audience engagement does not have to be Professor Carlos Lopez, oh sorry, Carlos, I can now call you Carlos. Carlos, um, can you clarify X, Y, and Z? Okay, so that's not the conversation. We want to hear your opinion, your perspective in response to that. So you don't need to do the clever question that allows you to basically get into the room what you think should have been said. Okay, so we don't need to do that. That's like, that, you know, that's not necessary. It's not the space for that. Um, and uh, yeah, um, so all of that said, we are live uh, because we deliberately restricted the numbers to who's here. Um, so we are live streaming on YouTube. Um, so obviously, uh, don't get too comfortable. Okay, uh, Trevor. Um, so um, yeah. So last point is um, we've had the privilege of working with a wonderful uh, community of people at the University of Utrecht that's here um, on, on the exhibition that is outside. Uh, it's a joint project we have in Urban Futures. And it's also an opportunity, so instead of you doodling in your usual doodles that you're so proud of, we're kind of giving you doodling material in the conference bag and so that you can talk back in other registers. So if you don't feel so comfortable to speak uh, in the bigger room, uh, please do this. So we've got 10 examples of things we think we can all learn from. You can tear off uh, from these uh, what you're interested in. There's a QR code, you can learn more about that. And part of this is that we really want to underscore the fact that even though we are talking that there's a huge set of challenges, that actually a lot is going on. And there's a lot of people doing a lot of work on the ground, and let's honor that as well, and the exhibition is trying to do that. And we are asking you to respond to these two questions. Um, what does sustainable infrastructure mean to you? Um, and then which infrastructure intervention could be a game changer to accelerate sustainable development in African context? So yesterday, of course, I was very conceited I kind of told an in-joke with the academics that tomorrow I'm going to just use Game Changer and I don't have to put it in inverted commas. Um, so, you know, so that was at your expense. Um, <clears throat> and then lastly, in your bag, uh, there's these cards which is meant to substitute for your usual doodles. Um, so please, like, write words. Um, or you could draw. Actually, you could draw. It's absolutely fine. But there's cards where we are asking you to engage and please paste them on the board or put them in the box uh, if you're a bit board shy um, in the course of today and tomorrow. Um, so uh, some very, very practical matters then in conclusion. Um, you've got Wi-Fi logins um, and that's obviously just to tweet, I guess, uh, and whatever else you do these days. I'm not sure if I can still say you're supposed to tweet. Um, but uh, um, yeah, skanda. Um, so, uh, and then we've given you, not these things, they're just for the speakers, um, but we've given you a metal bottle so you can fill up on your water over the next two days by yourself. Um, we've made the time for conversation and the space outside and in the exhibition uh, inviting for you to have meaningful conversations. Um, and so they're slightly longer, but do come back on time so that we don't have the challenge of this morning of having to start late. Um, and then uh, um, I've said we all live streamed and then this evening we're kind of having a formal 
unveiling of the exhibition, and uh, it would be wonderful if you stay for a drink and join us for that. It won't be very long, but we want to honor the work that was done and the, the people who are profiled in the exhibition, so that's at the end of today. There's a whole bunch of people that have worked incredibly hard to make uh, yesterday and today and tomorrow happen, and I'm in particular grateful to the ACC advisory board members who've agreed uh, and the Amali board members who've agreed to step in as session chairs over the two days. And uh, um, yeah, I, I, I'm just grateful and, and, and thank you so much. And then finally, of course, for the speakers, the panelists, and, uh, and, and, and all of the other people who are documenting what we're doing. So we have a, a bunch of people that have thought what I've just outlined to you is not too crazy. And so they agreed to support us financially and in other ways, and I'm grateful they are on the board, they're in your program. I'm not gonna go through that list in enormous detail, but just we are incredibly grateful. Representatives of all these organizations are here. They're part of the conversation, they're in the room. Um, we will start, go back in time to the weekend, a uh, year from COP27, and then I'll introduce the first panel. Please. Thank you for this opportunity to share this message with you. Edgar, thank you so much. I'm so sorry I couldn't join you in person. And of course, Chairman Pele, thank you for your leadership and all that you do for the betterment of Africa's cities and Africa in totality. The African Infrastructure Futures Conference is an important gathering, important because our cities are the fastest growing in the world. Infrastructure that's needed for our cities for the next 50 years has not yet been built. Imagine what that means for the potential for us to develop these cities in a green, climate resilient way that brings prosperity to our cities in ways that we haven't seen before. We have a largely young population. The average age of Africans today is 19 years old. And what that means for our prosperity is enormous. I want to start by sharing some of my reflections from Shamal Sheikh. I just came from COP27. And I must say, as always, the COP outcome is a package. It's a package deal. And part of this package, at least for Africa today, we needed to see clear commitment and trust building around the most urgent issue of loss and damage. The package and a finance facility that supports loss and damage in Africa was one of the most important outcomes we were hoping for, and we got that. There is every reason for us to celebrate that action. It was 30 years in the making. Imagine that, 30 years for us to eventually acknowledge that the pollution that's going on in the North is causing undue suffering in the South, unjustly, because a lot of that is not for reasons that have been caused by the South. So loss and damage, a wonderful victory in Shamoshi. But there was also some cause for disappointment. We saw perhaps almost no movement on the highest emitters around the world cutting global emissions. There was no mention of oil and gas in that um, in the package, especially around mitigation. And we did not see as ambitious, natural, naturally determined contributions coming back from especially the G7. These are issues that we must double down on as we move into the next year and into COP28. We must ensure that we see significant uh, commitment, significant ambition from, develop, from the developing world around this because it will make no sense at all for us to be busy working on the worst impacts which is what loss and damage is about and not adapting and mitigating they must go hand in hand so in our work in our cities in africa we must continue to build resilience and invest in adaptation because we cannot see yet the commitment we need from the global north 
that's one thing I wanted to, to share. And the implications, therefore, for Africa cities is to double down and build resilience. Infrastructure that is investing in the cushioning of our citizens, urban water resilience, the food systems, marketplaces where our women and, and food production can find a place for marketing. And we must also remember that policies that support women entrepreneurs and youth entrepreneurs, this is going to be an important part of how we move forward. The commitments to sustainable development and of course to systemic action therefore are urgent. We did not see in Sharm El Sheikh the doubling of adaptation finance as we had hoped. This is going to be an agenda for COP28, but the implication again for cities to build the sort of platforms that we will continue to build our action on. If we allow these to fail, we will be exposing ourselves because our cities will continue to be the magnets for urbanization, our magnets for young people seeking jobs. We must invent, invest in creating the platforms that will bring about the sort of infrastructure we want to see. We also know that today in Africa, renewable energy potential could not be greater. Africa has 19 times the renewable energy potential the world needs today. We are quite simply a renewable energy powerhouse. We need to invest in renewable energy in a way we have not seen before and ensure that we couple industry with this renewable energy. With the right cost of capital, of course, and that's why in Sharm El Sheikh, you would have also seen significant pressure on the World Bank and other multilateral banks and international finance institutions to work on reducing the cost of capital. That will unlock the possibilities for renewable energy. And nowhere more than cities will we see the uptake of this renewable energy as we power industry, as we power our homes, and as we transform lives, because that's what will drive job creation and prosperity. The entrepreneurship is already there, we know that, but we need to make sure that they have the energy they need to make the transformation. So entrepreneurship as well, a critical part. And I wanna finally say, that our youth will continue to be the hubs of innovation. We must invest in them, but they will need absolutely uh, the conditions for entrepreneurship. We need to see that they can conduct their businesses, set up businesses without too much red tape. And of course, that they can build industry and build businesses with secure energy sources. All of these are connected and nowhere more than in our cities will they be needed and needed um, greatly. We have got to begin to imagine a, the transformation of our cities with resources that we have, renewable energy that we have, potential human resource potential that we have through our youth. We have everything it takes and our cities are ready for it because actually, to be honest, this has not yet been developed. So we have the opportunity on a clean slate to transform our cities for the future. I want to urge you to be frank with each other, to be bold in your ideas and in the, in the ideas, and of course to be generous, because that's what Africa needs right now. Let's think big, because that's what we are. And I wish you all the very best as you move into this important conference. Thank you very much. So that, of course, was Wanjira Matai, the Vice President and Regional Director for Africa for the World Resource Institute, C coming to us not live, but uh, from two days ago in, uh, in Egypt. Now, it gives me a great pleasure to introduce the first panel for this morning. The chair of our panel uh, is Mampela Rampele, uh, who is currently the co-president of the Club of Rome, and she holds many, many other accolades, which I will not go into. So we've got everyone's bios in here, and there's, of course, uh, Google on your phone if you really want to go do a deep dive. Uh, so we are just going to get straight to the content. Mampella, may I welcome you and the panelists to the front, and uh, I will hand over the chair to you. Thank you. So just uh, before Mampella starts, an announcement that I'll... Um, other panelists, uh, Mark Swilling, um, uh, 
yeah, how do I put this delicately? Um, Mark had, a, had an unfortunate incident uh, uh, after he descended a couple of thousand feet from the sky. Um, and uh, he is going to join us from his recovery bed on Zoom. Um, so what a trooper. Um, so yeah, so Mark had, a, had, a, had quite a serious accident a week ago, more seriously, and uh, had operations in the last week and still decided to join us virtually. Um, so uh, we will bring him up on Zoom a little bit later, I think, Alma. Um, but yeah, uh, just, just so that you know why Mark is not here in person. Um, but as you can see, we've held a chair for him and, uh, and Peter. So thank you. Nampel. Thank you very much, Edgar. And thanks to the audience. And the good news about the audience is that it's more reflective of this continent useful, energetic, and I'm sure we're going to have amazing conversations. My job is to enable this amazing panel, uh, which includes Mark, who is listening, and I think, Mark, we need to have a conversation about age-appropriate <laughs> engagement. <laughs> I also just want to comment about how proud I am that we are having this conversation in a building that looks like our continent. And that's really what I would like this panel to help us focus on. That the issue of the African city goes beyond the physical infrastructure. As Edgar pointed out, the beginning of the conversation ought to be in the reimagining of the African city. And in that reimagination, we've got to embed it culturally. We are a continent that is not only the cradle of humanity, but we are the cradle of human civilization. We talk sustainability, just go to Egypt and see how our ancestors, those many, many hundreds, thousands of years ago, imagined and designed for sustainability using natural material. And so I'm very grateful to see in the exhibition initiatives that are taking place across our continent that are in fact tapping into our rich heritage. But let's start by listening to the very able and eminent uh, panel. We'll start with Joe Da Silva, who is the Global Director of Sustainable Development uh, in Arup, which I believe it's a good way to start, to start with uh, the people who are the channels of life, <laughs> uh, particularly uh, holding you together. Jo? Uh, thank you very much, um, and uh, good morning to everyone. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, Edgar invited me uh, to bring a private sector perspective from a practitioner, the firm Arup that I work for, is an independent global firm of planners and engineers and designers. And what we do is help uh, create cities um, and infrastructure that I believe is the sort of the stage set on which life plays out. Uh, much of my work has been in Africa, um, you know, championing the need for um, better infrastructure, more infrastructure, but over recent years also speaking to people with the money sitting quite often in the UK. And I've got some sort of fairly candid comments uh, to make to date, and Ed Edgar's encouraged me to be candid. Um, the first thing that people don't realize outside of Africa is that Africa is where the majority of new buildings and infrastructure is needed over the coming decade. And that means you have a voice. Um, you need that infrastructure because of the deficits that exist already, but also because of the growing population. Um, and it's not thinking about infrastructure in terms of roads and bridges and buildings, in terms of what it is, but thinking about what it does. Um, 
It's infrastructure that's needed to connect cities and towns, infrastructure to protect coastlines and communities who are extremely vulnerable to the impacts of climate change, and also um, infrastructure, of course, that provides essential services to those living without access to water, sanitation, healthcare, um, education. Um, all of that needs to happen. It's not optional. But it needs to happen without adding to climate change. And that um, tension between the needs that exist in this continent and the worries that people have about the future of climate change is an equation that, that really needs to be uh, balanced. Um, at the moment, the built environment is responsible for about 40% of emissions globally. And at COP last week, it was clear that the built environment is now in the spotlight. Uh, and we're building, to, 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 to do the amount of building that we need, that's, a, that's building a city the size of Paris every week. And so we're not going to reduce that 40% unless we transform the construction industry. And the things that are going on towards that transformation are things like the introduction of whole life carbon uh, costing as dual currency so that every decision on a project gets made based on cost and on carbon. It's switching to circular economy principles where you only build if you need to and then build for the long term, ideally using local materials and service-based um, solutions. At the moment, 30% of the construction waste in South Africa goes to landfill. That's a lot better than in Europe where the figure is 80%. But the point is that those materials are wasted and they could be used to build the future. There are some very big issues that need to be addressed. We need to fundamentally rethink urban development. The cities around the world have grown up on a property-led commercial development model. Um, and they've tended to be characterized by urban sprawl. There is growing recognition of nature loss and the fact that urban sprawl is a major function of nature loss. And the nature agenda and the climate agenda are driving conversations about urban development. We can't afford for cities to grow, to take up fertile land, um, and to degrade soil. We need a different urban paradigm, and Africa has got a chance to be a leader um, in that. That urban paradigm, I think, starts with the land. It starts with thinking about hydrology, about ecology, about geology, because there's large parts of Africa that are also vulnerable to earthquakes as well as to climate change. And so it's a place-based approach to urban development that is people-centered and embraces nature as a key stakeholder. Many other parts of the world are trying to worry about fixing the mistakes of the past. And I think the pace of change that's going on in this country, there's an opportunity to actually lead the way in terms of that transformational change. But there are really practical things that need to be overcome, financial support and technical support. And I just want to touch on some of the challenges that are really out there that I think, I hope we're going to get a chance to discuss um, over the next couple of days. Um, there's such a lot of focus on finance and not enough focus on what is going to be funded. So yes, more money is needed, but whilst the efforts are underway to attract that private sector investment, to attract blended finance, to get the global commitments to more money coming from the global north, there needs to be equal effort going into identifying what the investments are that that money is going to be spent on. Every single financier I talk to says there is no shortage of money. There is a shortage of what they call bankable projects. But therein lies the second problem. Because a bankable project is their definition of value. Whereas actually a bankable project needs to be definition of value to the community who that project serves. So we need to look at wider definitions of, of value that embrace 
sustainability and resilience and equity. The third thing that is a real challenge is that projects, investments, tend to be conceived and approached as one-off, one-time um, one -time investments. It's very, very fragmented. And we need to move to a much more integrated and, and systems-based approach. I'm delighted to learn that there is now Infrastructure South Africa. I've worked with Infrastructure Australia, the National Infrastructure Commission in the UK. Even in those countries, having a National Infrastructure Commission is a relatively new thing but is game-changing in terms of getting integrated approaches to infrastructure and prioritizing the things that really matter most. Another disconnect that needs to be overcome is procurement. We can't, we've got to think about how infrastructure is planned, designed, built, operated, maintained for periods of 60, 100, 120 years. And at the moment, that value chain is very long, and the procurement process creates really critical disconnects. One of the things that's a major challenge when you get to donor funding is that firms like mine who can get involved in conceiving projects, working with local governments, building up those trusted relationships, are then precluded from actually doing the detailed design work. This is a nonsense. Um, two more things that I think are worth raising. One is risk. Um, risk on infrastructure projects tends to focus on the risk to the project. People are worried about delays to the, to the delivery period. They're worried about increasing costs. Not enough thought is given to the risks that that infrastructure project can create for local communities. I'm talking about changing drainage patterns so you're increasing flooding for na neighboring developments. Um, and there was some wonderful work that I was involved in a few years ago with ACC, Urban Arc, that really looked at this um, and really found that infrastructure can create and compound risks as well as reduce risk, even if it's well-intentioned. My final point really picks up on what Wanjira was saying about innovation, about harnessing the power of youth. Um, but we really need to recognize that there's a really se severe shortfall in engineering capacity. If Africa is going to build its future, we need to build the skills and capabilities of um, people in Africa. Um, you know, typically, one wants to have about one engineer per thousand people in the population. Um, across Africa, the figures are much lower. One in 10,000, one in 100,000 in some countries. Um, and so investment is needed in developing that um, skill space. And there is a virtuous circle because you can't develop that skill space in isolation of projects. If people are going to upskill, they need to then deploy those skills and learn by doing in the delivery of real projects. And that's a virtuous circle that I think really needs to be created. Doing the projects over here and trying to build capacity over here is, it, it, you know, it, it just doesn't work. Um, so those are simply a few thoughts to, to kick off the discussion. Um, and really look forward to, to carrying it on over the next couple of days. Thanks, Joe. I think the issues you are raising go to the very heart of, are we having in mind emulating cities in the rest of the world or continuing the colonial model of the city? Or are we having a conversation about making a contribution as a continent to a different way of thinking about cities. And what Wanjira said and what you're saying suggests that we need to be moving in that direction. And so let's hear from Carlos. Uh, Carlos is a professor uh, at, here at home at the Nelson Mandela School of Public Governance. Let's hear your wisdom on these matters. Thank you. I was involved in the drafting of Agenda 2063, so I want to use the offering of um, Edgar to tell you a story. Uh, I think st storytelling is always very compelling. So we were in 2013 commemorating 50 years of institutional history of the African main organization, the African Union, 
and the then president of the commission, Kosasar Adlamini Zuma, uh, proposed that instead of just having a celebration of the 50 years, the jubilee of the, of the continent, to try to see whether we could project the next 50 years. What would we expect in the next 50 years? And uh, that took uh, first the shape of an interactive conference with heads of state that lasted about five hours and for which I was invited to be the moderator. It was the first time that we introduced a device in the African Union that became very popular since, which was uh, a capacity for the technicians to cut the mic after five minutes of intervention. <laughs> <laughs> so the heads of state were not amused and I was in that very difficult situation where I had to you know, sort of explain to them that it was not me, uh, it was someone else that was doing that. Uh, still, uh, this was a very tense sort of environment because of that very interesting feature. But there was another very interesting surprise in that session. We had some persons that were invited to be facilitators of certain points of discussion. And I, as the main facilitator, was supposed to sort of do the role that you are doing uh, today, Mambela. And uh, it was interesting that one of our guests was the former Prime Minister of Jamaica, James Patterson, that insisted in the preparatory meetings that I had with them that he could not tell me about the surprise that he wanted to use during the session. And I started to become a bit you know, nervous. What is he going to do? I mean, we can be upset by a situation where heads of state will not feel comfortable and try by all means to persuade him to tell me at least in confidence what he had in mind. He refused. He said it will not be a surprise. Uh, so I had to wait like everybody else for the surprise. And the surprise was when he was about to intervene, he, he made a sign uh, with his hand to someone that I didn't know about. And then a song started uh, playing in the plenary hall. And the song was from Bob Marley. And uh, it was so much trouble in the world. For those who know the, the song. Eh? So much trouble in the world. And after a few minutes, a few heads of state start dancing. <laughs> and then others joined. And then, you know, everybody in the, in the room had to dance because those who didn't have the sort of the moves felt a bit embarrassed and, you know, tried their best <laughs> not to sound too ridiculous. So we had all this room with full of energy people dancing. And that's when he made another sign. The song stopped and he said, this is what unites Africans with their diaspora. We are the only ones that can dance when there is so much trouble in the world. <laughs> and this is where we are. We have so much trouble in the world. And that's how the Agenda 2063 really started. Then, you know, we had to draft what was discussed in that interactive session, and the rest is history, you know. Um, but I think we are still with so much trouble. And uh, one evidence of that was definitely COP27. I just coming back from Sharm el Sheikh, where I saw Wanjira and others. And you know, uh, let me give you my take because you know I prepared something very beautiful about you know how my my, my uh, views on uh, urban uh, futures in Africa and so on. But you know, Edgar was so provocative with this introduction. He, he does it in a sort of a smooth way, but it's more or less lots of warnings, you know, that you can't. <laughs> and, you know, I just threw my entire speech out. And I said, let me, let me just tell you what is my take on what is going on right now, because I think it's probably more useful. I think we have lived through a trajectory of growth, and you know this because of Club of Rome, that has got us into lots of developments that we, we cherish and that we consider were good for the, for the world. But there are two that everybody now agrees were terrible. One is that you know, the level of emissions that this growth trajectory provoked is unsustainable. So the planet cannot cope with it. So this is something that we cannot pursue. It's not something completely new in limits of growth, 
there was already a discussion about, you know, you can't do with this level of consumption. You, you know, we'll never be able to, uh, you know, give uh, everybody the same rights as the privileged one has, have at that point. Uh, because, you know, the planet will not cope. But it was a bit fuzzy and abstract. But now we have scientific evidence. We have lots of details. We have targets. We have indicators. So we know this is unsustainable. So it cannot really continue. And the second thing that has provoked this trajectory of growth is wealth accumulation. Well, there is no dispute about it. That the innovation, the intellectual property rights, the research and development could have created, technologically speaking or in any other field, the opportunities for us to live all very well. But that's not what is happening. So if you divide you know, the total uh, world GDP by the number of people in the planet, you can have more or less $4,000 per family of four everywhere in the world. But that's not really how we manage it, as we know. Do we need to go the radical route of completely changing this trajectory? Probably not, but we need to adjust a number of things. And that is urgent. So what do we need to adjust? First, we need to accept that some had no responsibility for this trajectory. They had their natural resources explored, like in Africa, and they have not benefited most of the developments that took place, and they are not real net emitters. Just the Congo Basin has sink capabilities that are far more than all emissions that Africa does. So that tells you that it's not just this discussion of climate justice that we emit less than the others, we suffer more. No, we actually provide sink capabilities for the world that are absolutely essential. In fact, now there are some theories that say that the Congo Basin more than the Amazon. So there you go. This is the real debate on loss and damage. Instead of framing it you know, in sort of technical terms and all the rest, it's about compensating for the damage that this trajectory did, that some did not benefit from, and rather suffered from. And I call this a carbon credit. We have a carbon credit. That's fantastic. We have a carbon credit. The others have a carbon debt. So how do we translate this into an instrument, into a program, into a policy, into a new form of seeing the world? Well, there are different ways we can go about it, but certainly, if we look into the megatrends, let's take the three most important ones, demographics, climate, technology, and we look into how the world can get out of the conundrum. You cannot get out of the conundrum without the African demographics because Everybody is putting their eyes into the Malthusian view that Africa's population is booming and this is a disaster and all that. That's partly you know, a challenge, no doubt. But what is less talked about is the fact that the rest of the world is aging very fast. And because it's aging very fast, we have a major problem. You can start all the way from COVID and seeing where is the genetic pool that resists to the new pandemics, to whatever. So it's a very vast program, but definitely from a demographic point of view, what is happening in Africa is of extreme importance to the world. And this includes urbanization. And I will come to that. The second mega trend, climate, it's obvious that despite us being able to make a huge list of all forms of compensation that we need, we are not going to solve this with aid money, because this is what we are talking about. If you look into the OECD DAC data on ODA, it has not increased over the last years. It has increased 1%, 2% in some years. In fact, during the pandemic, it increased slightly. But basically, development money is now being labeled climate finance. That's what it is. It's not new money. We are recycling. Now there is a new fund that comes from Sharm el-Sheikh. It will be another labeling issue. It's not new money. The money is limited. And even if 
concessional lending is attaining historic levels by international financial institutions, what people normally don't mention is the fact that these historical levels of lending correspond to, in fact, in percentage terms, much less than the GDP growth of Africa, which has doubled during the last 20 years. So it's, it's not commensurate to the importance that used to have in the past. So what do we need? We need a, a, a real reform of the financial system that is going to create the responses to the challenges that Joe was mentioning. You know, how we evaluate risk. You know, basically, if you talk about renewables immediately, everybody jumps and says, we need to de-risk. Really? You de-risk something that is good for the nature. So the rest is what? Oh, that's not risk. The rest is fossil fuels. You see that the language and the terminology leads us to the wrong thinking. It's the same as saying Africa has a lot of concessional lending that comes from international financial institutions, but in fact, you know, when the European Central Bank decides that Germany is going to get 0% interest rates, they are getting concessional lending, not Africa, which is very small amounts. And if, you know, you take the entire sovereign debt of Africa is equivalent to Netherlands and Belgium together. That's it. So they are no risk. We are a big risk. Why? We have a carbon credit. We have the best options for renewables. We have 60% of the possibilities for green hydrogen without which we cannot attain the level of emissions that are required by the targets of Paris Conference and so on and so forth. So that's the climate. Then you go into technology. Normally, I, I like to provoke people by saying, okay, who is the most apt to deal with goods and processes that are tech intensive? The older guys or the younger guys? Everybody knows the answer. So you talk about digital natives. Where are the digital natives? Since you know one in every two newborns from 2034 onward are going to be African. Who are the digital natives? They are mostly African, and it will increasingly be so. So from a consumer market perspective, the tech intensity requires that youthness of Africa is absolutely amazing market opportunity. And I'm not even talking yet about innovation, just as a market opportunity. You cannot ignore it. And yet, this is not the way it is presented. You know, you have makes in China that do cell phones uh, for Africa they, that they don't even sell in China, that, you know, have, you know, a market penetration of 30, 40 percent. Because they saw this demographic opportunity. So this is, this is just the beginning of a curve that is going to be much more intense. So if we, if we look at it from that perspective, you cannot really bypass this consumer market. But then there is the innovation dimension. The innovation dimension is that we know from uh, historical studies and literature that leapfrogging is a, a catchword and it's very easy to throw. But in fact, the leapfrogging capabilities depend very much on a number of things that we have to do right. But when we do right, it's real. We can really leapfrog. And you have very good examples, both in Asia, in Africa, of leapfrogging because those conditions were established. And when they are established, it's amazing what you can extract from a young population and an urbanized young population. And that's, that's where we have to see you know, the cities as an opportunity, an opportunity for these young people uh, to be part of this transformation that I was mentioning. So Mapele has allowed me to uh, speak up to now without uh, interfering, <laughs> but she's, she's doing with me what uh, James Patterson, <laughs> Prime Minister of Jamaica, <laughs> also did. So I'll, I'll rest my case. But I, basically, I want to you know, frame this discussion about urban transformation into the major changes that are taking place in the world. And these changes are going to introduce a completely different discussion about what is really necessary for addressing the climate. 
it's not going to be development aid. So let, let's not celebrate all these different labelings of aid that in fact is all about over-promising and under-delivering. We need real systemic changes. They are on the way. I'm private to a lot of conversations that are taking place that demonstrate that they are on the way and it is up for the Africans to exercise their agency. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paro. <laughs> Edgar said in the introduction, language matters. So the language of carbon credits and carbon debt and how that shifts our narrative and the paradigm that uh, Joe was talking about is critically important and this idea that we're getting aid from somebody it's again part of the dummies that we have been fed for hundreds of years and I believe and it's good that uh, Trevor is in the room the biggest issue that needs to be addressed if we are to free ourselves from this wrong narrative is the tail that's wagging the dog, the financialized economy that we have. Why are we aping this kind of approach to economics? We need a new economics to be able to be free people and be able to reimagine our future. Mark, this is a good moment to bring you in, my dear man. Uh, I did scan a bit about you, why you are not here, but that we'll have as a private conversation as proper Cape Tonians. Uh, we now want to hear your words of wisdom, both from the perspective of the DBSA, but also as someone who has been in the sustainability environment for a very long time. What words of wisdom about a reimagined African city and how we go about using the rich heritage we have. Uh, thanks. Thanks very much, Mantele. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. I think what I would like to do is plunge into an issue that, that both of the previous speakers have, have addressed in one way or another, which is to ask the question whether the global financial system is fit for purpose. And I'll be drawing on my own experience, uh, but also recent research for the International Development Finance Club that we've done in collaboration with the BBSA and, and for the UN. I think a useful point of departure uh, would be the Financial Services uh, Bureau report uh, of 2020, which uh, outlined in broad, crude terms that the total value of financial assets in the world today is four. $160 trillion. And that is equal to 628% of GDP. Now, if you go back to, say, the 1960s, roughly between 30 and 50% of financial assets um, were, uh, financial assets were, sorry, 30 to 40% of, of, of GDP. So there's been this massive ballooning of financial assets and a set of rules that reproduce the disconnect of the financial system from the real economy. And as long as that disconnect continues, we can talk forever about infrastructure uh, and sustainability, but the, the allocation of capital will not achieve the goal. In it, the, 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 the UNEP's Green Economy report in 2019 said that underlying cause of the crises we face is the misallocation of capital, that's a direct uh, quote. So I'd like to really address that and maybe signal, you know, what, what, you know, how we could, how, how, how we could think about. I mean, after all, we've heard for many years now that there needs to be an alignment between finance and, and the SDGs, but there isn't a finance SDG, um, which, which is, which is <laughs> obviously worth thinking about. But there is also been at the same time, a significant increase in climate finance, according to the CPI, Climate Policy Initiative, up to three, six, 632 uh, uh, billion is now in, um, in, in climate, uh, up from 364 in, in, in 1920. 
Um, so it's, it's a significant increase. The target, however, is four to five trillion. And Nick Stern at, 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 uh, during, during COP27 said, developing countries need two trillion per annum. The IMF is quite bullish, 1.6 trillion in, 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 in debt-related uh, ESG, uh, which is over 100% more than in 2020. Uh, there's 4,000 signatories of GFAN, uh, the Glasgow um, Financial Assets for, um, for Net Zero, and, but that number is reducing because people have got some cold feet from 45 countries controlling $130 trillion of, of assets. But at the same time, 11 of the biggest European Union banks have between, own between them 522 billion euros worth of fossil fuel assets. That's 95% of their equity. They face stranded assets on a massive, on a massive scale. 60% of the world's biggest banks invested 4.6 trillion in fossil fuel assets <laughs> since 2015, when the Paris targets uh, were adopted. There's 1.8 million companies, mainly based in the OECD, who own 43,000 of the oil and gas assets. So we need to ask, in light of these some crude numbers, you know, is, is the global financial system fit for purpose? If we, if we create in our mind's eye a matrix with uh, increasing towards green on, at the top end and increasing towards red, i.e. social justice, uh, on, on, on the vertical, you'll end up with light green transitions on the top left and dark green transitions on the bottom right. And you need to then ask, well, if we want decarbonization with social justice, which is what has now come to be called the just transition, uh, is how much of the global financial system is actually geared towards that? And I, I would just, I don't have time to elaborate, but I think not very much. And that really uh, captures the, the, the problem. So I think it's in that context that just any transition partnership is significant that came forward at COP27. Yes, there's lots of problems with it, et cetera, et cetera. But it does say to the world and to local South African investors, address the question of decarbonization in relation to social justice and find financial mechanisms in order to, the, in order to do that. And the Just Energy Transition Investment Partnership framework is a long-term transition framework. It talks about 1.5 trillion worth of investment through to 2030, and the, and the 8.5 billion um, uh, is a small drop in the ocean. You know, we're talking about 128 billion versus 1.5 trillion rand just in the next five years. Uh, if we want to, if we want to make make a dent, if we want to actually start bending the curve, and and so it, that raises the question: Are the financial institutions coming together to deal with this? And Shantan Naidu, who was one of the authors of that report, uh, presented a keynote address yesterday at the International Sustainability Transitions Conference, where she was asked this question, and she basically said she doesn't think so. Uh, so, you know, let's look now at the South African banks very briefly, the South African banking sector. According to Penelope Hawkins, who published a, a chapter in the recent handbook on the South African economy, South Africa's banking sector is one of the most profitable in the world, in one of the most unequal societies. So this, this is clearly completely unviable and unsustainable, and it's unsurprising that uh, capital continues to get misallocated in our country. Uh, but also globally, given the conditions. So what starts to shift? And I think it's in, it's in that context that many of the global calls, and, and Carlos has been part of that, for reorienting, in particular, the publicly owned banks, the development finance institutions, there's, 200, there's 527 of them now around the world, uh, the multilateral development banks, uh, the sovereign wealth funds, which have a long-termist perspective because they're owned by states. How do we... Uh, find ways in which the more long-termist publicly, uh, uh, publicly owned banks with a greater appetite for risk start to make the courageous decisions. And I agree completely with, with Joe who said, what really matters is bankable projects. There's actually is quite a lot of finance. A lot more can be um, um, generated if the kinds of bankable projects start to emerge. But what bankability what bankability requires is, is institutional coherence. 
and appropriate governance. And that's where, in, in the African context, we are, we are particularly weak. And, and I think the second thing that we need, in addition to the, to the institutional capacity for generating these projects, is the capacity for blended finance, how we blend public and private sector funding over the long term in a way that doesn't subsidize profit, but does provide directionality. Otherwise, uh, you know, if, if, if those people who say, you know, you know, just focus on the public sector, forget about the private sector, basically they're saying, let the rich enjoy their riches and have no social responsibility. That's not, that's not going to make a real significant impact uh, on the African context. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mark. Uh, the issue of a ballooning financial system is really making the point about the tail wagging the dog and it's become completely out of control. And yet, there is an almost worshipping of the financial system by public policy makers. I mean, the idea that you, you think you can reduce inflation by penalizing people who, who have the least to contribute to inflation when you are dealing with an externalized factors of inflation. It just shows the absurdity of it all. And the issue of bankable projects, as Joe uh, uh, indicated, it really is a values-based uh, judgment. What do we value, not in the short term, but as she said, in 50 and 100 years' time. And that thinking is not part of the current system. So uh, can I just have quick one kind of liners, and then I want somebody on, from the audience who would like to also raise a question to the panelists. Just indicate, and is there a mic, or what, what do we do? Yeah. Okay, so whilst, whilst the people are getting mic'd up or getting to mics, can I just have your quick reaction, um, Carlos, and then you, and then back to Mark. Thank you. No, I, I just wanted to uh, uh, make a, a couple of very quick uh, compliments to uh, what Mark said. Uh, just to, to illustrate that about 5% of climate financing is actually coming to Africa of the world total. So that, that shows that we are really <laughs> not the ones receiving it. Yeah. And, and, and to make the point even clearer, uh, you know, I'm part of the United Nations uh, net zero uh, high level panel that proposed in the COP27 ways of uh, tackling the issue of greenwashing and how uh, there, are, there are claims about net zero that do not correspond mm -hmm. to reality and we found that the, one of the major comp culprits were actually the financial sector, that they claim to actually do climate-related actions that they are not uh, uh, the case. Yeah. So we have now established standards and certifications that hopefully will, will, will deal with that issue. And the auditors of the European Union Commission, their auditors, their auditors said that 60% of the projects that they claim are climate action related were not accurately defined as, as, as such according to their own taxonomy. Yeah. So you, you can see that there is a huge number of uh, sort of greenwashing uh, uh, trends that we, we need to tackle. And last point, uh, it is very clear that uh, from uh, studies that have been published by IRENA and the International Energy Agency that if you, if you take into account any renewable, any renewable, maybe with the exception of geothermal, it's cheaper uh, to invest in Africa from a, 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 a return of production point of view, but it's the most expensive from a financial point of view. So you are penalized for going into where is the best uh, sort of return. And this is, this is nothing new. Uh, iron ore uh, in, in Guinea Conakry is the largest deposits in the world. They have the highest percentage of, uh, of iron ore. But, you know, the concessions are with Rio Tinto that has mines in Australia that they protect by not exploring that yeah. iron ore 
in Guinea-Conakry, but their value in the stocks goes up because they have the concessions. Joe? Um, I really wanted just to sort of make a, a, a point about climate finance. Um, for years now, I've sat in meetings where people talk about climate finance. Um, the amount of money that's available for climate finance is trivial compared to the amount of money that's available for investment in infrastructure, in urban development, and in industry. I sat next to a very, very senior person from the World Bank at dinner at COP, and I, and I shared that thought with him. And I said, am I wrong? Am I missing something? He said, no, you're absolutely right. Mm. Climate finance is a political issue. It's a very small amount of the finance that's available. And it's a very small amount compared to the infrastructure deficits that exist on this continent. Mm. And listening to the conversations at COP, I suddenly had a light bulb moment because the conversations at COP were beginning with climate finance focused on decarbonisation, and there may be a little bit more for adaptation and resilience, and, oh, we should do this equitably, it should be a just transition. This is entirely the wrong way around, mm. because actually what we've got to start with is how do we ensure that we can create um, urban environments, rural environments, infrastructure, that meets the needs of everyone, which is really what the Sustainable Development Goals are about, and that we actually address the very big issues of energy access, access to water and sanitation, healthcare, schools, etc., and start there with finance for a development agenda prioritizing development needs, and then make sure that those investments are contributing to adaptation and resilience because the future is very uncertain and there is so much climate change baked into the system that there is all sorts of challenges ahead. We are, we've got to design for the future, the weather and climate in 10, 15, 20, 30, 100 years time is going to be very different to today. And we've got to factor that in. And firms like Arup, we're trying to work out how to do that on a day-to-day -day basis um, on our projects. And then, actually, if you're going to build anything, make sure it is as low carbon as you can possibly get. And again, that's a huge opportunity in this continent to create this new shift, a new paradigm of urban development, a new, a new paradigms of construction that are based on local materials. And you know, a project that, that, that we've done recently in Rwanda, the Rwandan Institute of Conservation and Agriculture, used all local materials, local timber, rammed earth. You know, those, those materials have become culturally, uh, perceived as culturally inferior in some places, but actually some of the best architects and designers in the world are really looking at amazing creative ways to use materials, um, you know, to build in timber and build high rise. And so we need to imagine a different form of urban environment um, and then harness the power of the up-and-coming generations in Africa and skill them to be able to deliver that. And I think that that's an opportunity for the continent. Um, in the same way that the Netherlands has seized the opportunity of being a country that is regularly, regularly flooded, it's now positioned itself as a country that is one of the leading experts on flood management and water management. Um, and, you know, this continent could do the same but in terms of, of construction. We need to decolonize our minds and celebrate our heritage. Mark, what are your thoughts? Well, the bottom line is the installed electrical generation capacity on the African continent is less than France. Um, if Africa energizes using fossil fuel, none of the Paris targets will be achieved. And those facts together basically say the whole world has an interest in a sustainable pathway uh, for Africa. The question is how Africans are going to be able to take advantage of that opportunity and what kind of institutions are going to come together, in particular the financial institutions, the African development finance institutions, the African universities, the African consulting firms and the rising number of African venture capital firms 
come together and say, we can do it. Uh, and it, it's not going to happen in a big bang. It's not going to happen with the usual African policy conference verbiage that we go with we hear all the time. It's going to happen with a slow buildup of a succession of impactful and alternative ways of doing projects. Thank you, Mark. It looks like we have come to the end. What is clear is that Sorry, we can do a few. Comments. We can do yeah, a few go, comments. Like minutes, yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay, so there is a merciful 10 minutes. Yes, ma'am. Where's the mic? Just state your name. Um, my name is Annabelle Marian Horn. I'm from Western Cape Government Department of Environmental Affairs and Development Planning. Um, so this is a question really for Mark. Um, he spoke about the importance of having... Um, funding that's blended funding, I guess both public and private. Um, I'm sure that he's well aware that in the Western Cape government we are um, very fearful and concerned about um, corruption and we have no systems in place um, in our financial systems to receive um, private funding. Um, there are a couple of um, systems like Cassidra outside of ourselves that you probably know. Um, so I would ask your question, the question to you is how do you see the splendid funding happening? Is it going to be in parallel funding, um, given um, that we really can't accept private um, money um, into our government systems, in local government, in um, provincial government anyway, and local government? Thank you. Mark? Well, well very briefly, um uh, the president a few years ago, two or three years ago, I can't remember exactly, requested the DDSA to set up uh, the infrastructure fund, which is now South Africa's biggest blended finance vehicle. And the commitment was 100 billion from the fiscus, 900 billion leverage from the private sector, and that was in anticipation of regular inflation 28 with reforms that is really going to unlock, well, hopefully unlock large quantities of funding for infrastructure from the private sector. So, so, and those projects are happening, and as far as I know, uh, there's, no, there's no corruption in the way in which those projects are happening. But, the, but the, the second point I'd make is the PCC is about to go out for a, a request for proposal for the design uh, of blended finance vehicles um, that can uh, play a role in the 8.5 billion, uh, but beyond that. Uh, so I think we're moving, you know, interestingly enough, a very small percentage, I think it's only two or three percentage, two or three percent of the budget for the medium term uh, strategic framework is actually for public-private partnerships. We, we chirp away at partnerships all the time in South Africa, but actually in practice, that are very few and far between outside the renewable energy sector where, where the reef has been a success story. Thanks, Mark. Are you happy? Uh, one more opportunity, there's a mi the middle there. Yes, stand up, sir. Thank you. Uh, my name is George. I'm an architect from Nairobi. And uh, I'd just like to ask um, how we can uh, improve um, intra-Africa uh, infrastructure uh, connectivity and uh, exploitation of our resources because uh, all the talk about funding is based on uh, the fact that we are considered to have no money, uh, but we know money is, um, is an artificial value. We have a lot of natural resources that are being exploited. We don't add value. Uh, they, are ex they are exported. Value is added, then we are sold back at exorbitant prices. Uh, but there's very little intra-Africa relationships in terms of infrastructure, in terms of sharing resources and ideas so that we can grow money instead of waiting for money to come from outside. So how do we do that? Thank you so much. Who's going to comment on that? I can uh, just uh, mention that uh, there are five dimensions for regional integration uh, that are studied in Africa and that are part of the uh, Agenda 2063. You have productive integration. It's basically establishing value chains. You have macroeconomic policy convergence, which is necessary to ensure a certain level of uh, 
transactions. You have uh, free movement of people. Uh, you have um, the issues of trade, which is the continental free trade area. And then there is the infrastructure. This is the fifth dimension. So you will not be able to actually uh, uh, deal with regional integration by just investing in one of these trucks. You cannot have really intra-Africa trade progressing without integration of infrastructure. You are not going to capitalize on some of the gains of trade if you don't have macroeconomic policy conversion. You will not be able to do that without people actually circulating freely and so on. So I think uh, it, it's a very good point and uh, uh, just wanted to say that through the program for I I infrastructure development in Africa, PIDA, there are 16 projects that have been identified as the catalyst for a regional integration through infrastructure. And I'd just like to add that, you know, from a private sector perspective, regional integration is very attractive. Um, at the moment, for an organization like mine to work in Africa, we have to engage with each country individually. Um, and whereas actually what would make life much more easy for us to invest in Africa is if by setting up shop in Nairobi, we could actually trade in all the East African countries. Um, and you know, when we actually started our office in Nairobi, that was the hope. But the fact that that integration doesn't exist poses obstacles to firms who actually want to come to Africa and you know, work in Africa, um, employ people, <laughs> you know, and grow business in Africa. So I think it's a really important point. Um, I, I think that's one of the biggest elephants in the room is the lack of not just political will, but young people in Africa who buy into the rhetoric about uh, national, nationalistic uh, pursuits instead of harnessing the power of this free flow of people, instead of young Africans drowning in the Mediterranean, they, many of them are engineers, many of them have got skills that we should be using. I think that's a big issue. More questions, please? Or comments? There's one right at the back there and one close to you there. And then that will be it. Unfortunately, uh, good as the discussion is, it's got to come to an end before the five minutes. Yeah. Thank you so much, colleagues, for the presentation. I'm Wilbert Kwanda. I come from Dar es Salaam at our university. I was wondering, listening to the comments and the opinions about the resources and potentials we have, including the carbon credit. At the same time, I was looking at African situation in general, saying it's a weak partner in the negotiation. And therefore, all the, all the expectations are not being realized because of the power structure and the position of African countries in general in the negotiation process. Where do you see the opportunity for Africans to come out and negotiate? Because this is a process of negotiations. There's no way Africa can stand and say, this is what we want and we'll get it. It's a process of negotiation. And negotiation is a lot of attribute of power relations. Where do you see the opportunity in the coming decades? Thank you. Negotiations. Do we have the power or not? Well, Young, powerful, innovative mm. continent? Well, the, the, the African group of negotiators uh, was the one who had been insisting on loss and damage for so many years, and eventually we got uh, sort of the recognition of the importance of the issue. It's not a new issue, but it's one that is now moved into the same category as mitigation and adaptation. Uh, uh, but unfortunately, as you rightly pointed out, uh, most of our negotiators continue to be boxed on this development aid sort of mentality. It's about how much aid you get, uh, rather than how you transform completely the systemic problems. Uh, and I, I don't think we are ready yet at the continent level in terms of negotiations to, to move into the, the type of discussions that I was alluding to. But this being said, uh, even when we are, and there was a, a good demonstration of that during the pandemic, uh, we, we end up you know, with the asymmetries uh, showing their ugly face. Uh, we insisted that we wanted in the WTO to have a waiver on patents 
for the production of vaccines. And after lots of negotiations, we were given a prize. Yes, we give you the waiver. And the waiver is basically for X number of years and with a lot of conditionality. And when this X number of years will finish, we'll return to normal. Uh, what is interesting is that that X number of years is the number of years that takes to build the capabilities in Africa to produce the vaccines. So by the time the capabilities are ready, there are no waivers anymore, except for uh, South Africa that already has that capability. So you can see that the asymmetries always show up. And unless Africans become much more united in the way they uh, go into these international negotiations, it will continue. Absolutely. The last uh, comment, and then we'll take a uh, comment from each of the panelists. Thank you. Um, I'm Victoria Dubridge from the International Growth Centre. Just a quick uh, question or comment. I recently heard in another forum, I think it was someone from UNCDF, talking about the concept of bankable city plans rather than bankable projects. And he gave a really nice example of uh, having you know, a beautiful conference center on the one side, a uh, state-of-the-art parking lot on the other, but you have to walk over you know, hundreds of little potholes to, to get between these two pieces of infrastructure. Um, but just wanting to get, I don't know who this directed to, maybe, maybe the panel as a whole, but thoughts on that as a concept and whether that's a way of looking at, at maybe this idea of blended finance um, in a more concrete way and moving from you know, specific projects to thinking about the city as a whole and as the system that it is. Thanks. Thank you very much. I think that's a good note uh, to frame each of your final comments. We'll start with Mark. Yeah, I think that, that makes a, a lot of sense. I mean, we do have a history in South Africa of city support programs driven by National Treasury uh, um, that has that kind of intent, but it hasn't really panned out as ambitiously as, uh, as posed in the question. Um, I think as we move into this new era of blended finance, it's going to require cities to step up to the plate. Those that do get their act together, formulate the infrastructure plans, which, which is uh, in, our, in our policy framework, in fact, Edgar and I drafted that policy framework, uh, integrated infrastructure plan. Um, you know, that could really make a very significant difference and it would make the lives of development, fin of, of development finance institutions much easier. So the DBSA, we try and provide that kind of uh, grant funding support to help in particular poor municipalities to develop those kinds of integrated investment, uh, investment plans. But you need a lot more of that uh, across the African continent. But I think it's a very different animal to national infrastructure plan. Uh, so the, my worry is that uh, what becomes of the city level infrastructure plan is simply seen as a local version of the national plan. I think it's something different, uh, which has got all, which will require all the sensitivities to socio spatial and cultural dynamics. Thank you, Mark. Joe? Um, I think um, I've heard, heard integrated um, national infrastructure plans I touched on earlier, and the, the, the integrated city plans are the sort of, you know, uh, uh, um, complementary uh, vehicle. Um, I don't think it's optional. I think it's absolutely essential. And the reason that I think that is because whilst we can approach mitigation in terms of individual projects, because we're counting carbon like we count cost, we cannot approach adaptation and resilience in terms of individual projects. Um, you know, resilience and adaptation is very much place-based. Um, and it is the result of all the decisions and actions and investments that have happened and are going to happen. And it's not one individual project that's going to make a community resilience. It's, it's multiple projects and how those all add up together. Um, you know, to give you an example of a sort of bankable city plan, uh, we have just carried out a urban, master, an urban drainage master plan for the city of Shanghai. Now, that was achieved by using satellite technology, machine learning, to analyze the satellite pictures and to understand the city and the complexity of the city of Shanghai as a patchwork quilt where different parts of the city had different abilities to absorb water or attenuate water or store water. And as a result of that, we've come up with a bankable 
urban master plan, which is multiple, multiple projects that can be implemented over many years and can be adapted as the climate changes. But that's a radical shift in how we, you know, we're thinking about urban investment and actually saying, let's look at it at a city scale. And the point is we can do that because of digital technology in a way that we actually couldn't even as recently as five, 10 years ago. Um, and that, that sort of notion of sponge cities at that scale is the type of thinking that could actually really you know, be mainstreamed in Africa um, and help with the leapfrog that Carlos was talking about. Thank you, Joe. Carlos? Uh, I actually echo that, and I would just add that the metrics for adaptation are very difficult uh, for financing purposes. And therefore, you know, you have this uh, climate, uh, sorry, this project finance model that has been built with due diligence, with certain steps, characteristics that are very difficult to use for adaptation. It's relatively easy to use for mitigation, but very difficult to use for adaptation, which basically calls for a different type of discussion and, and framework. Thank you. I think we have come to the end of a very exciting and challenging uh, session. But I think we would be remiss to leave here without linking this to what is the obvious gap. But when you talk about Shanghai versus Cape Town or Nairobi, what we have as one big missing link in Africa is an understanding by citizens and their leaders of the importance of local level leadership. It's not the place where those who couldn't be fitted in at the national and provincial level should go. It is a highly technical and a highly challenging space that requires real bold leadership. So I want to leave us uh, with the notion which should be taken up with the rest of the conversations you will have, that Africa has everything ready for it to become an absolute dynamo. What will, the game changer is the quality of leadership and the values that drive that leadership. On that note, I want to thank you for being such a lovely audience and thanks to the panelists. Thank you. So on housekeeping, um, we will break for uh, our coffee break now and be back at 22, please. So you have a five minute credit on your break, I'm sorry. Um, so please at 22, be seated. Uh, we've got a, a multimedia presentation to start of the next session, so um, don't be late. Thank you.